Okay. Is it visible? Yes, it's visible. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Tunde, and thank you to all the organizers uh, for, for, uh, for the invitation. Uh, really happy to be here a second time around. Um, and uh, I've really enjoyed listening to the fantastic talks uh, so far, the ones I've managed to attend. I'm actually in, not in Buffalo, I'm in Jodhpur in, uh, uh, in the middle of the Thar Desert uh, at Indian Institute of Technology here. And I'm on leave, I'm on sabbatical leave uh, for several months. So I've been unfortunately quite occupied, which is one reason why I'm guilty of not having attended every session like I did last time. So I'll talk about something which is a little different from probably most of the uh, most of the conversations that have taken place so far in this nonlinear physics group conference. I'll talk about frequency and amplitude attenuation using decorated granular metamaterials. So this work's been done by uh, Professor Luis Machado. Luis was my former postdoc, uh, and uh, Unfortunately, he is unable to actually present because he is on vacation in Rio. And so I've been uh, tasked with uh, presenting it. But of course, Tunde invited me. But anyway, so I'm not that guilty. Um, so basically, let me move this uh, window on my screen a little bit. Uh, so, so basically, what I'm going to talk about is um, how, do we how do we deal with frequency and amplitude attenuation uh, of, of sound? Okay. Now, the reason why this problem attracted my attention some time ago uh, is because if you look at the numbers, uh, about half a billion people in the world uh, is hearing impaired. And this data is as of five or six years ago. Now, half a billion people out of uh, 7.8 billion or eight, uh, seven, yeah, or 8 billion is a, is a big number, right? But it's worse, it's getting worse. So by 2050, which is very much in the horizon now, uh, we are looking at a number which is close to a, a billion people. And it's also true, apparently, that approximately 90% of people with moderate uh, to profound hearing uh, will actually be residing in the poorer countries, lower and middle income countries. And therefore, you know, this is taken as a very serious health issue by the World Health Organization and many other, many other groups. So this, uh, this is what attracted my attention to looking into ways to uh, make systems uh, as sound uh, ab absorbing as possible. Now you can say there are soft materials and so on. Yes, most of them are, are plastic materials or, or fibrous materials. Many of them are not, not the most sustainable materials nor can they be easily 3D printed and so on and so forth, nor can they be miniaturized and so on and so forth. So there are advantages to various materials one, one, one might choose uh, and granular materials therefore have their own potential advantages. So that's the reason why uh, we decided to look at um, granular uh, materials. Now, uh, this is one of my boilerplate uh, slides because uh, I've previously spoken on granular materials here and elsewhere many times. So in granular materials, like you have in the Newton's pendulum on the top right, you, uh, you have Hertz law at play. So as the grains compress each other, the repulsive force between the grains builds up rapidly. This is the Hertz force. And this Hertz force is given here by the Hertz law. And you can see it's, a, it's an intrinsically nonlinear law. There is no linear term at all. And this coupling A turns out to be important. It, it includes the two uh, Young's moduli uh, of the two spheres in this case, if they were to be different. And uh, many years ago, uh, Vitaly Nesterenko used to be from Novosibirsk. Vitaly uh, has been a professor at University of California at San Diego for uh, many years, since mid nineties. Uh, Vitali had showed that if you take an alignment of, of grains, like here, like in this tube, and if you put an impulse, uh, in this case, on the right side, you will actually see a solitary wave that goes through the system, and that will be recorded in this pressure gauge on the left in this experimental picture. So in other words, uh, so, uh, granular alignments transmit solitary waves. 
So therefore, uh, granular alignments have been of strong interest to people for a long time. Uh, the equation of motion that is uh, that one can use would be this kind of an equation of motion. Uh, this big delta here, that's like a preloading. So if you go back to our uh, previous system uh, out here, if these cranes were to be pre-compressed, in this case, they are not, as you can see, they're touching each other. But if they were to be pre-compressed, then that would be manifested through a non-zero value of this delta. So it's a non-perturbative uh, system here. Uh, and one can show that this kind of a system actually uh, transmits uh, a solitary wave pulse, which is about uh, roughly about three to five grain diameters wide. Why are they um, uh, as wide as they are? Well, the reason basically is that uh, here, for example, if you look at this potential uh, V of delta versus delta, delta is basically overlap, which means how close the grain centers are to each other. That's what delta means. Uh, the, the dashed line is a, is a quadratic curve, and this uh, two-third curve, or five over two in this case, actually, for the potential is the blue line. And you can see that this blue line grows more steeply than the quadratic curve. If a potential grows more steeply, that means it becomes energetically more expensive for the grains to remain in contact, which means the grains would like to break their contact, which basically means that the energy is, energy is transmitted in a bundle. That's what it boils down to. So this is my intuitive explanation as to why uh, solitary waves might be expected here. And in this picture, uh, the top left is the case that we are dealing with, where you can see that the uh, pre-compression, this delta that I alluded to, is zero. And you're getting one solitary wave here. Uh, there are some other small solitary waves. I will not talk about it. I've talked about it earlier, I think, uh, last year when I spoke. And then if, the, if they remain pre-compressed, it turns out that there is an oscillatory, uh, there's an oscillatory tail that tags along. Again, that is not really important for us right now. So moving on, uh, Vitali uh, showed a couple of things. One of the things he eventually, uh, well, one of the things he first pointed out was that the equation of motion for strong compression uh, likely is a KDB-like equation or a KDB equation. Uh, it turned out that was not true. Uh, it turned out, yes, you may be able to reduce it to a KDB equation, but it does not behave like a KDB equation, meaning there was something complex about uh, the way the real system works. Uh, so he later went back and tried to make delta, uh, this pre-compression quite weak. And it turns out that gave uh, the equation the red box that turned out to be more or less correct, approximate, but more or less correct. And that gave Nestorenko's famous solution uh, for which obviously he's very happy, as you can see. But uh, the bottom line is that um, the, the solitary wave solution can be can be seen, but only in the weak precompression or strong nonlinearity limit. So let me now come to another system, which is a tapered system, tapered chain. Uh, you can look at any one of these chains. Uh, if I were you, I would look at, for example, the bottom right picture where you have this granular chain with interstitial grains. You don't have to have the interstitial grains. They actually make a system more um, energy dispersive, not surprisingly. But suppose you remove these interstitial grains, it becomes a simple taper chain, but the tapering is defined by this Q of D, Q sub D. Basically, Q sub D is by how much the grains shrink, the grain radii shrink. And it turns out that if you look at any of these uh, diagrams that, that I've put up, uh, K sub n is the is the kinetic energy of the last particle, which mean which in this case would be the extreme left particle, um, and and so so essentially <coughs> the kinetic energy of the last particle is, is severely degraded with respect to the initial kinetic energy when the number of uh, grains goes up. In this case, you can see at n around twenty, and when the tapering goes up. In this case, uh, we have studied tapering until point one. Now, this system is not really analytically solvable, but if you make it a hard sphere, it's very easily solvable. And those solutions are given in this paper and many other papers by others. We introduced the system a long time ago. As you can see, we called it the decorated taper chain. So the taper chain and the decorated taper chain systems have turned out to be pretty well, well accepted and used uh, impact absorption systems in, in many devices. So moving on, 
uh, we did a number of different studies with the goal of getting back to the original problem, which is designing systems that are, um, you know, amplitude and frequency attenuated. So, now it turns out there is no easy formula, as, at least as far as we could tell for uh, findings of systems. So we initially studied with two sets of uh, systems. As you can see on the top, A1, B1, and C1, the pictures I show, uh, we initially examine what happens in terms of simple transmission of an impulse uh, of a system of uh, grains with same size, a, a, a tapered system. As you can see, these systems don't have uh, any, any wall on the, on the right. And then you have a system where you actually have interstitial grains, but otherwise a monodispersed chain. And these interstitial grains are kind of interesting because we have made them fixed uh, on the wall. So what that really means is that these grains can get squeezed. These, these small dark grains can get squeezed, but they don't carry kinetic energy. That's what it means. So in other words, they are welded tightly such that as, uh, as a uh, energy, kin kinetic energy propagates from k equal to one to k equal to two, uh, this little guy here plays the role of uh, impeding this transference of energy quite a bit. So that's one system we studied. Now, the impulse system is actually not all that interesting. Uh, it's not uninteresting, but it's not interesting enough. Uh, what is more interesting turns out to be the case when you actually drive uh, on the left side uh, in a sinusoidal manner. And you can vary the frequency, you can vary the amplitude and so on. So, so this is really where we're getting into the nitty and gritty of the sound. So these systems turn out to be notoriously difficult to study, something that we had observed uh, back in the early 2000s and, and wrote some papers on it, but nobody paid attention because this, this seemed very odd. Uh, it turns out that they have some interesting applications and the applications uh, sit, in the, sit in the domain of uh, sound absorption and so on and so forth. So we studied these three systems. First is the monodispersed chain, second is the tapered chain, and third is the same system as in C1 above uh, in red circle, but now you have these frozen interstitial grains. In other words, this extra factor that can make it much more, much more uh, energy, much more uh, hesitant to, to transfer energy easily. So with that, let me uh, move on uh, if I can. Okay. So this is the equation of motion. Uh, uh, where essentially this is this is the way to write uh, the pre the, sorry the, the compression of the grains as they squeeze against each other. Uh, the initial velocities in the perturbations we we took are not very large, but uh, they are not very small either. At thirty meters per second, the system still remains quite elastic uh, in terms of being able to use Hertz law, and in all these systems, uh, there is always some kind of um, Restitutive loss because these are macroscopic systems. The restitutive loss is often not huge, but it's there. And one way of sorry, one way of modeling it is by uh, taking the ratio of the unloading over the loading force and writing it as one minus w, and then w is a small number, typically 0 0.1, 0 0.05, something like that, much less than one. Uh, moving on, here is a, a study uh, in which we have taken. Uh, the C1 system, C1 system was the one in which you have the grains, and then you have these frozen beads, but the beads are, beads are compressible. And we tried out what kind of materials for the larger grain and the smaller grain turn out to give us the best possible couplings. So here are nine cases of material combinations we studied. The materials that provide the largest value, uh, let me see if I can get it largest value of uh, A, this quantity A here, turn out to be the better materials in this case. So that would basically mean um, the largest numbers when you take uh, two of the materials. For example, you can take uh, tungsten here and delrin, which is like plastic here. And it turns out that is uh, the best one with the largest value of Y star. Um, in this case, uh, it basically gives you uh, 
an impedance mismatch. That's really what it, what it does. But anyway, we had to find it by trial and error. Another thing that we had to do was we also had to pick out what kind of radius of this small guy you need and what kind of radius of this large guy you need. Turns out to be about 0.2 is the best, but then it's not easy really to, to determine that because at least we don't know of any obvious uh, simple theoretical ways to figure it out. We, we worked on it, we couldn't figure it out. So here you can see uh, the, the momentum of the, of, the, of the striker versus that of the particle at the other end, the last particle, uh, number of uh, grains in the chain, and uh, the small r over big R. Again, to remind you, this is, this is small r, this is small r, this is big R. And it turns out, as you can see, that uh, the momentum attenuation is the largest just around here, 0.2. And this is the two-dimensional pictures around 0.2. And it is indeed for uh, Delrin and, and, and uh, uh, sorry, Delrin is the big, big particle and, and tungsten is the small Fritz particle. Uh, so I said it wrong, my apologies. So anyway, moving on, if you, instead of, so this was an impulse problem, obviously, um, from the left side, but if you actually now turn on the actuator and keep driving this sinusoidally, uh, then you can ask the question as to what happens on the right side. So this is the case when you have a monodispersed chain, and this is the case when you have a tapered chain. Uh, on the other end, the, the, there is a rigid wall, by the way. That was not the case uh, in these studies. As you can see, it was an open system, so the last particle could, could pop out, and so it was easy to measure the momentum. So it was a one-shot deal because we are studying an impulse. This, on the other hand, we are not studying an impulse. We are studying uh, an actuator. And here, here we can ask the question as to how will this actuator transmit the various frequencies and various amplitudes for, for this XACT, the driver. It turns out that the frequencies that it would transmit or not transmit are on the y-axis, and uh, the actuator amplitude are on the, are on the x-axis. Uh, as you can see, we have taken the monodispersed chain we have taken, which is uh, without this, without any dispersion, any residuative loss. So this is W equal to zero, W equal to 0.1. We have also taken uh, some tapered chain systems with small W values, and it turns out that um, they tend to transmit uh, the, the vibrations pretty okay uh, at low enough frequencies, but they don't like to transmit the vibrations at high enough frequencies. So you can see, for example, if you have a if you have a tapered chain um, out here, then um, you you really at, at small uh, amplitudes you are transmitting up to about 400 hertz. If you raise your amplitude, you might get up to 600 hertz, 650 hertz, but no more. You won't be able to go further up. The systems have natural uh, frequency cutoffs, and that's partly because uh, of the uh, of the way the hertz force works and uh, the ability of the trailing grains, meaning the grains that are further down, to follow the first train. So it can't really keep up with the vibrations of the first train. It tends to slow down. And physically, that's the reason why these cutoffs come, but the exact values of the cutoffs, uh, we are not able to analytically uh, reduce. One comment I would make is we have, uh, these are extremely uh, time intensive, uh, and highly accurate simulations, the, uh, we, have, we have actually looked at systems where if instead of spheres, you took disks. So that would actually give you, instead of a Hertz law, a harmonic law between, between the grains. Uh, what differences would arise in that case? It turns out that there are some differences, but they're not as dramatic as I thought they might be. So, so we wrote a paper on that. I, I, I'm not talking about that. I just wanted to mention it. Now, moving on, it turns out that all these systems uh, actually have some high frequency cutoffs, as I said. And if you look into the dynamics at the microscopic scale, just like I said, and this is the dynamics of the fifth grain, and this is displacement, this is time, uh, and this is the dynamics of the actuator part. And you can see that the fifth grain's dynamics is very, very different from that of the actuator part. Uh, it, it's, it's much, 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 much less in, in displacement. This is much higher. We're talking a number which is way above two. This is uh, like 0.3 or something. 
and this also attenuates. And eventually the system can't keep track of it. And by this time already, you are getting into a cutoff if you're looking at the gain factor, where the gain factor is essentially a ratio of the output amplitude and the input amplitude in this formula, the standard formula. So moving on, uh, if, you, if, you, if you turn on uh, the tapering as we have, uh, if you have the W value here, and, and in this case, um, n, is, n is five. So it's a small, very, very small system, which means it's super tiny. You can 3D print it out very easily. Um, you are really talking about a system where you have a transmission region that, again, gets around 600 to 800 hertz, depending upon the amplitude. But above that, uh, it, it works as a, as a very, very high quality uh, sound filter. Uh, moving on, if you if 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 you take this system which is tapered uh, without interstitial grains versus this system which is not tapered, which is actually a soliton transmitter, um, but now with this interstitial frozen grains, uh, this is the kind of phase diagram that you end up with after a lot of work. And if you look at the numbers here, it basically means the entire system has become an acoustic insulator. It doesn't literally transmit any measurable amount of sound just by putting in the interstitial grains. So it turned out that this interstitial grain strategy was, was very successful for us. Uh, another system that we looked at over several papers uh, was this uh, granular crystal, if you will. Uh, this is a relatively straightforward crystal. Everything is monodispersed with interstitial grains. Uh, on the right, we have a somewhat more funky system where you actually have tapered taper chain type structures, which are natural impact dispersion systems, along with inverted taper chain black structures. Uh, not quite an inverted taper chain, but like it because they're not in contact directly. So if you look at this system, uh, it turns out this has actually somewhat improved uh, properties of, of signal uh, uh, dispersion than even, than even this one that I showed you. But before I go there, let me point out that even if you take a two grain system, just two particle system, even that is a very good uh, sound absorber or sound dispersion device. So uh, this is actually a two particle system. And here you have uh, the region where uh, the signals are transmitted uh, at, low, uh, at low amplitudes uh, and low frequencies. The dynamics can be quite chaotic. But at higher uh, amplitudes, uh, it is it is very good. If you're looking at uh, three three to five, three to about seven or eight kilohertz, uh, in this region, this is the input at the left end, uh, or or the bottom here. This is the output at the right end, um, and uh, it's okay. It kind this is of course transmitting it uh, as you would expect. It should be more or less the same. Uh, on the top here, on the other hand, when you enter the filtered region, this is this is the input and this is the output. So input is here, output is there. And even a two particle system cuts out uh, the higher frequencies, which is not a surprise because if you if you drive this grain, uh, the grain uh, on, on the top here is much more constrained. It tries to follow it, which is the case here, can't follow it after a time uh, when, when the motion builds up and the compressions build up and ultimately its motion really slows down. There's a natural retardation that happens. This system becomes uh, quite interesting when you actually see uh, the slightly uh, bigger, bigger system. In this case, you have a real two-dimensional system uh, with the same kind of architecture. In fact, a little bit more sophisticated with the taper chain and the inverted taper chain uh, staggered with one another. You are driving uh, sinusoidally from the left. And here, here you can see uh, that uh, there is some level of, of signal uh, transmission um, in the in the lower uh, frequency, and there is uh, a, a very significant uh, cutoff uh, signal uh, uh, filtering. Uh, sorry, uh, at, at the higher the higher frequency regime. So, so again, this is quite an improvement on, on the things that we have done in terms of how things are transmitted. Uh, coming to the last system, I want to tell you this is a paper that we have just submitted where we took an even simpler system, where we took the taper chain system, uh, but in this case, the small particle is being uh, driven instead of the large particle being driven, which is the case we have traditionally 
uh, studied when we first introduced it in 2001. Uh, and the literature essentially has studied, uh, studied it as an impact dispersion system, in this case, going from right to left. That's how the literature uh, has done it. That's how we began it. But now, what if we reverse it? What if we just drive the small grain? Now, as you can see, it's a bit of an uphill climb for the, for the energy to move to the right because um, it has to go through uh, larger and larger particles that, that in itself creates a strong inertial mismatch, uh, not to mention what happens when you drive it, not to mention what, uh, what materials you want because that also fixes the couplings. So we chose uh, a very light material. This is the nickel titanium material and Teflon, which is very easy to find came out of NASA, as you know, probably. So anyway, the nickel, the, the nickel titanium and Teflon combination system turned out to be very good. And I will uh, not take you through the big detail uh, unless you're deeply interested, but this is the kind of stuff that you get. In this system, quite interestingly, uh, at, at, at low frequency and uh, across interesting amplitudes, uh, you actually get a transmission region. So, so the signal transmission is quite good, uh, but then you have an amplification region. You have a region where the signal is actually amplified, which was a surprise for us. But it turns out that in this system, because of that mismatch and the geometry I, I showed you, this geometry that I showed you, uh, you know, the, the, there are a bunch of uh, particles uh, here, a bunch of particles here. This three is an interesting number because remember I, I mentioned that the solitary waves are three particles wide. So whenever you put in three or four grains, uh, there tend to be a little bit of a, tends to be a little bit of a solitary wave-like propagation, although this is not monodispersed, but still the tendency remains. So that was the reason why we chose these three grain clusters. So it turns out that anyway, there, there's this amplification region, and then there is a strong filtering region where the impact transmission, where the sound transmission uh, goes away. But this amplification region is, is uh, quite extraordinary. We didn't expect it to become a sound amplifier. So summing it up, if you have a noisy system like here, uh, you go back to Nesterenko's uh, transmission system, you go back to the impact decimation system, you play with it, and you can essentially come up uh, by trial and error largely uh, with, with a variety of ways in which you can uh, design pretty good quality uh, impact absorption uh, devices. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Right, you have questions. Uh, is my understanding correct that in your in, in all the cases you consider here, um, the system is pre -com pre compressed? It is not pre compressed. So the grains barely touch each other. If you pre-compress it, God knows what will happen. I see. So without pre-compression, I'm just wondering how would you be able to get this um, in the non-atomic chain? How would you be able to get this um, uh, transmission band and forbidden band? Because, oh. because the equation will be just nonlinear terms, right? So, so if I understand your question correctly, you are saying why should there be this kind of uh, uh, this kind of geometries where uh, the, the amplitude and frequency wouldn't transmit, is that what you're asking? Yeah, so the, if my understanding is correct, I think the, the equation without pre-compression, I think the, the equation will be only this delta plus power um, three half, and right. not to idealization, so there is no um, the transmission band and problem band. Correct. You're absolutely right. So if you have a if you have a single um, if you have a single um, uh, monodispersed chain, all you'll do is put put the solitary wave through. But even if you have a monodispersed chain that I have here in in figure B one, uh, suppose you are not even driving it, you put an impulse in. Even then, you wouldn't be actually having a solitary wave transmission. Your transmission would be severely altered because this is actually no longer a purely one dimensional system. The energy will go from here to here, loop, sorry, uh, here to here and lose some because it will squeeze it. And then it will come here and the energy will also go from here to here. So if you, if you observe, 
um, they have been designed in such a way that there are many touch points. There's a touch point here, there's a touch point here, there's a touch point here and here and here. So that's intentional. That's to keep it such that we don't pre-compress. That's, that's one point I wanted to mention. Second point I wanted to mention is the reason why these dead zones, so to speak. So in other words, the, the amplitude and the frequency don't go through. Why that happens is because you can have very easily a scenario where uh, a grain is moving like this. This grain is, you know, has a different neighborhood. Its frequency may be higher or lower. Uh, and so all kinds of possibilities might happen. And you can easily see that the, that the oscillations of the first grain can essentially kill off whatever is happening here, or it may be very small amplitude, very high frequency, uh, and that small amplitude might die off. So those are the kind of things that we had to look for and hence design the system in such a way and play around that you can precipitate those, those kind of uh, dynamics that you, you would like. So in other words, they're strongly, strongly phase mismatched and strongly, strongly amplitude mismatched by sheer design in this case. The fact that shear design can give you this was not expected. At least I didn't expect it when we started first playing with it. So obviously, you know, when you have a coupling mismatch, when you have size mismatch, when you have boundary conditions, and when you have driving, God only knows what happens. Uh, that's the best I can say. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you. Do so we have any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Well, with all this, I got the privilege to close this wonderful international event at UAE University. I would like to thank all the speakers online and in person. Thank you so much. We did it this year in person. Last year we were online, we remember. So hoping for the best for the coming years. And of course, in the end, last but not least, the big man, the one man show. I, think, uh, I would like to thank all uh, the physics department uh, who organized, who invited us for this wonderful event, the organizing committee. And one man who deserves a big clap. Who is this? Today, please. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much today. Very wonderful. We tease you a lot. We acknowledge you a lot through emails, through text messages, calls, everything. But yeah, we understand your stress for organizing all this. Well done. A big hands to today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, with this, I think uh, we're closing. Wonderful day, day three. Thank you, everyone. Professor Salman, thank you so much. Uh, we are happy and glad we visited you and you give us the feeling of home. <laughs> uh, thank you, Leila uh, and uh, Deepa, new uh, in organizing committee. Everyone, thank you, Professor Hadi, Professor Yanis. You did it. You visited my place, huh? <laughs> I hope they treated you well. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Parent. Leave for coming. It's really, thank you. The in person, uh, virtual, all wonderful uh, presentations and talk. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. See you somewhere soon, <laughs> virtually or in person. Thank okay. you. Bye. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Well, it's nice to take a lot of photographs of today. I think the first day of the final one, so they won't be Okay, just one more shot for that. Yeah, I was
Okay, let's take a picture of last picture. <laughs> Just saying. What do you mean? Just saying. 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 Just so I sent you oh, yes. Yeah, I got it. Yes, I got it. Yeah, okay. Because okay. I'm using the mines. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You <laughs> hear <laughs> Okay, 
Thank you very much. Now, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Allow me to speak. Yeah, good. 